the nightly business report with Paul Kangas in Miami and Cassie Seifert in New York. Good evening. Coming up on NBR, the House of Representatives wraps up business for the year, but the Senate struggles on with a few remaining bills. A much calmer day on Wall Street as traders wait and hope for a cut in interest rates. NBR is made possible by Digital Equipment Corporation, leveraging investments in information systems for today and tomorrow. People come to us for results. The $63 billion Franklin Group of Funds, helping 2 million investors reach their goals since 1947. Franklin Funds are distributed nationwide by investment professionals. A.G. Edwards, member of the New York Stock Exchange, serving the investment needs of individuals and businesses through more than 400 offices nationwide. And is produced in association with Reuters, the world's largest electronic publisher, which provides NBR with news, market data, and communication services worldwide. A Congress anxious to return home to campaign rushed to adjourn today. The House wrapped up work this afternoon, although the official adjournment won't officially take place until the Senate concludes its business. Senators looking to force last-minute compromises held up major legislation on energy taxes and water policy. Darren Gersh reports from Washington. The 102nd Congress roll. slouched toward adjournment today. Form. It wasn't pretty. B.S. That's what they should say to all of us. Symbolic of the gridlock on Capitol Hill, New York Senator D'Amato launched a 15-hour filibuster against the tax bill, demanding it be changed to save jobs at a New York typewriter factory. There's an awful lot of people around here who should not feel good about the manner in which we leave the unfinished business of the people. D'Amato's effort failed, but comprehensive energy legislation is still threatened by a filibuster over nuclear waste. Just two examples of a congressional record many say is not worth writing home about. How about a disaster? Frankly, the president and the Congress battled to a draw politically, and I think that draw diminishes both the Congress and the president. We have now sent our members home. Our legislative effort has been completed. House leaders kept and, their traditional uh, end-of-the-session phone call to the president uh, polite but they'd barely hung up before the finger-pointing began. The only gridlock that has existed in this Congress has been the gridlock brought upon by the President himself. Last night, Democrats, with Republican help, managed to break that gridlock to hand the President a politically embarrassing first veto override on a bill to re-regulate cable TV rates. My position would have kept consumer costs down, but we were overwhelmed by a very good sales job on the part of the networks. There were a few substantive accomplishments. Congress showed some discipline sticking to the 1990 budget deal. It passed a transportation spending bill and a bill on higher education. But Congress did little on the economy. It ignored requests for more money for the thrift bailout and did little on health care. Voters may remember this Congress not for the legislation it passed, but for the checks that bounced here at the House Bank. This may be the last official day many members of Congress spend on Capitol Hill. Experts expect that angry voters next year will send the largest crop of freshman lawmakers to Washington since 1932. Darren Gersh, NBR, Washington. In the wake of yesterday's late, rip-roaring comeback on Wall Street, which slashed over a 100-point deficit on the Dow Industrial Average to a closing loss of a mere 21 and a half points, the stock market did a little backpedaling at the outset this morning as the Dow fell about 12 and a half points in the first half hour, undercut somewhat by weak bond prices on disappointment that the Federal Reserve had yet to cut interest rates. The broader market was quite firm, however, and that, along with solid gains in the airlines and rails, helped the industrial average improve as it posted an 11-point gain around 2.30 this afternoon. But then we saw a spate of selling send the Dow Industrial Average back down to a closing loss of 0.81. We ended at 31.78.19. Uh, we were down 13 and 3 quarter points by the best level of the day, uh, fr uh, from the best level, and up about 20 and a half from the low. Uh, trading volumes today way down from yesterday, but still active at 196 and 3 quarter million shares. Up volume exceeded down volume by 13 million shares. The transport index did well, up 13 and a half points. It was up nearly 17 at one stage. Utilities edged in there with about a third of a point gain. The closing tick a none too bullish, plus 162. Standard and Ford's 500 down 0.39. The mid cap 400 up one and a quarter points, or nearly so, while the 100 fell about one and two thirds points. A real mixture there. Commodity Research Bureau December index was up 0.20. 
The New York Stock Exchange Index down a small fraction. Value line rose 0.89, and the Wilshire 5,000 uh, inched in with a small gain of under two and a quarter points. The bond market was on the defensive today first because many traders thought the Federal Reserve would have cut the discount rate by now. It was also disappointment that Germany uh, had failed to ease its rates in response to urging by the world community. The latest hope is that there will be a coordinated joint reduction, but that didn't prevent tax-free and corporate issues from losing a quarter point on average, or longer-term governments from falling about three-quarters of a point, like the 30-year treasuries, down 23 30 seconds. The Shears and Lehman Long Bond Index was down nearly nine points, while Fed funds fell just below 3% on the close. Later on, I'll show you where the action was on Wall Street today. Kathy? Ross Perot's first TV ad as a presidential candidate will be shown tonight. It's called Jobs, Debt, and the Mess in Washington. And it'll be a 30-minute lecture on the state of the economy. Perot will also chastise government officials who become lobbyists for other countries, saying they're like generals who switch armies in the middle of a war. And he has harsh words for government officials who work in political campaigns. Now, even worse, and I hope you will put your foot down and make both parties throw the cards on the table, they've got these people on leaves of absence now working on presidential campaigns. Foreign lobbyists on leaves of absence working on presidential campaigns. That's like having Russian spies in the middle of a presidential campaign during the Cold War, because we're in a business war now, folks. Democratic presidential candidate Bill Clinton wound up his bus tour of Florida today criticizing President Bush for his foreign policies. Clinton focused on a program that's part of the Caribbean Basin Initiative. Critics say it encourages U.S. companies to export jobs to Central America. Clinton said it's an example of what's wrong with the administration's economic policies, and he promised change. You're going to be asked to fall for it one more time. They're going to feed you phony ads, personal attacks, misrepresentation. We're going to give you hope and a real plan for the future. The president, meanwhile, was commenting on a report about budget director Richard Darman. According to the Washington Post, Darman said the president's repudiation of his 1990 budget agreement with Congress, which included a tax increase, was, quote, sheer idiocy. During an interview this morning, the president brushed aside the story. It is peculiar timing, I will, I will admit. But, uh, you know, you get these inside TikTok stories. They have very little to do about what I'm trying to do for the country, what my answers are on principle. So I can simply say he's got my full confidence. The Post story says Darman saw the repudiation as a vote of no confidence in his work and offered his resignation. But Mr. Bush said that's not unusual when a member of the administration has a disagreement over policy. The challenges facing corporate leaders was the subject of last week's Business Week magazine symposium on chief executive officers and the changing American agenda. McGraw-Hill chairman and chief executive officer Joseph Dion says that he is confident that his company has had a fairly good year through the just completed third quarter. But Dion told NBR's Rodney Ward the economy will play a key role in the company's future performance. We're expecting a fairly good year. It uh, really resides in the, in the hearts and minds of those who want to advertise. That's our weakest segment at uh, the moment. And if there's uh, confidence in the, in the year on corporate America, on their own profitability and cash flow, then we'll, we'll do fine. But we continue to see uh, sluggish recovery, continued economic uh, uncertainty. Well, I think, uh, frankly, whoever wins this election is in for a very good ride, because I think this economy is a poise for a terrific rebound, and uh, we expect to, to uh, profit by that. Is that rebound going to be in part dependent upon who wins the election? Uh, I'd rather not comment on that. Do you believe that uh, your company is going to be able to match or do better than its first half performance for the remainder of the year? Well, if we match it, we'll be very happy. Uh, it's, un it's unlikely we'll outperform it. When I say electronic publishing, what does that mean to you in terms of opportunities for the future and lessons learned from the past? Well, it says to me that uh, the mix of our businesses is uh, changing over time. Uh, we haven't set out to become a multimedia publisher, but we are in fact becoming one because our customers are asking to be us to become one. And so uh, I think over time you will see a change in the mix, but I caution us that uh, in the last three years we've actually created more print product than we have electronic product. You've had some hits there. You've had some misses there. Uh, has the time now arrived? in terms of the development 
uh, for electronic publishing. Do we now see it beginning to take off where it hasn't been able to take off before? Uh, we were early, and I think we had some failures. But on the other hand, uh, no other publisher is nearly as well positioned as we are now to be a multimedia publisher because of the lessons we learned. What's required here is patient capital. Uh, Americans need to understand that when you're trying to transform in some fundamental way the way in which information is disseminated and shared, you have to be patient, uh, and there are lots of lessons that uh, need to be learned, and we think we've learned them very well. You recently participated in a Business Week conference on the changing American agenda. What do you see as some of the important con concerns that need to be addressed by this country? I'm very concerned that we will once again repeat our history of too quickly dismantling our military capabilities. The world is still very uncertain, and I don't think we should uh, uh, dismantle it too quickly. On the other hand, uh, the needs and the social services area and in education are so great that we really need to, to reallocate some resources in that direction. I, I'm hopeful that the American people will arise to this occasion because we're becoming non-competitive and if we're going to be the leader in the high technology, uh, which is the growth area, we need to have uh, students better prepared and that means every community needs to rise to the occasion. We continue our coverage of the Business Week Symposium tomorrow when we'll have a conversation with Humphrey Taylor, president of the Lou Harrison Association's polling firm. And still ahead on our program, we'll look at the latest product to hit the recycling market, some slightly used television commercials. Computer, a pioneer in selling personal computers by mail, is launching a big drive into the software distribution business. The computer maker has introduced a package of PC software and peripheral products called Dellware that consumers can order by phone for next day delivery. Analysts say the move marks a new strategy for the PC industry, which has been hosting a bitter price war. Paul Dell says it will not match its competitors' latest price cuts for desktop computers. And Wall Street liked that news as Dell's stock jumped a point in five eighths to close at $29 a share. The Dow Jones Industrial Average was up as much as 11 points during the day, ended with a small fractional uh, loss. Well, a large fractional loss, but a lot better than yesterday. And look at the broader market, much better. Uh, about 10 stocks up for every seven down. However, there were 12 more new lows for the year than new highs. Marriott topped the active list on 4.4 million shares, losing an eighth. Yesterday was up two and an eighth on news that it's going to divide into two separate firms, host Marriott and uh, Marriott International, and the Wall Street liked the idea. Advanced Micro Devices moving up one and an eighth. First, the company reported third quarter earnings of 51 cents, way up from last year's 16 cents. Shearson Lehman increased earnings estimates, and so did Montgomery Securities. And then the company said it's going to buy back up to five million of its own shares. Citicorp dropped three quarters. Unexpectedly, the company's president, Richard Braddock, announced his resignation, immediate resignation. The company's forecasting third quarter earnings around 8 to 13 cents. A little disappointment on the street, apparently. Merck was down a half after uh, making a good comeback yesterday. Tyco Toys, the big percentage loser of the day, down two and a half points. Solomon Brothers downgraded it from buy to hold and recommended swapping from Tyco into Mattel, another toy maker. Mattel moved up an eighth. Telmex down three quarters. The Mexican market didn't do much today. Ford lost three eighths. IBM moving up five eighths. General Motors down a quarter. And MFS uh, Intermediate Income Fund down three eighths, tenth in volume. Among widely held issues, telephone down a half. American International Group, however, did well, up three and three eighths. The Republic of China has granted the company a license to uh, do the insurance business in the city of Shanghai. Centurior Energy moving up one and a half. The company's in a joint recommendation with uh, customer groups to establish uh, rate stabilization uh, programs for customers of Cleveland Electric and Toledo Edison. Consolidated Rail up one and three eighths in that strong transport group, and Delta Air did well up one and five eighths after reporting September revenue passenger miles up 30%. Load factor was up about 4%. Pfizer, however, it fell two points. The May Baden Nugent brokerage cut 93 earnings estimates from $4.25 to $4.05. Novacare up two and an eighth. That was hit a little bit with the other health stocks a few days back and rebounding nicely. No news from the company. Pogo producing up one and a quarter. It owns one third of a test well in Thailand that looks promising. Metaplex Group up one and one-eighth. Positive comments coming from Kidder P. Uh, that's Kidder Peabody, which repeated a buy recommendation. 
and uh, Belding Hemingway up two and an eighth points. The company's in industrial threads and yarns, and Dan Dorfman's latest yarn is that the uh, company may be get a, a 40 or 42, 43 dollar buyout bid. Didn't say from whom. Carolina Freight losing a full point. The company is slashing its quarterly dividend from 15 cents to only a nickel a share, a 67 percent cut. Dean Witter also cut earnings estimates on Carolina Freight. Armstrong World down one and an eighth. Prudential Securities downgraded it from buy to hold. NASDAQ trading, a gain of nearly, well, a little over five and a third points, actually. Trading volume, however, way down, about 28 million shares, fewer than yesterday, but still active. About 13 stocks up for every 10 down. 100 index was up just over eight and a half points. Magna International A down two and three-eighths on news. The company's chief financial officer and two executive vice presidents are going to resign at the end of this month. The company's a Canadian auto parts maker, supplier, big supplier to Ford. Microsoft up three-quarters. Intel gained nearly two points. Legion down one and a quarter, while Amgen gained one and a quarter. McAfee Associates, a software publishing firm, went public today at a price of 16. Look at that uh, first day of trading up four and a quarter, uh, 2.6 million shares offered. Cisco up a point and three eighths. Similar gain in U.S. healthcare. Novell up a point. Borland International down one and three eighths. Kaiser Steel up three and a quarter. On news, the company's landfill project in Riverside, California, has been approved. Health Ometer products being weighed down by sellers off a point and a half. There, the company says that its third quarter revenues and earnings will not be met. It's uh, going to be worse than uh, the uh, street expected. And Photronics in the negative by one and a quarter. Fourth quarter earnings, the company says, will be 22 to 25 cents below Wall Street estimates. The American exchange, just over a one-point gain in the index. Volume well down from yesterday's pace. And 34 more stocks up than down. Kirby topped the active list for the second day in a row, down a half. Pacific Western Bank shares up one and a half. Uh, the American Banker magazine says this company has hired Morgan Stanley to find a buyer for it. And preferred health care up two full points. Uh, financial columnist Dan Dorfman said this company may get a buyout bid somewhere in the low 20s from United Healthcare. That's the Wall Street wrap up, Cassie. Paul, here's a marketing idea. A company in London has found a way to make an ad multiply. It takes old TV commercials and sells them to new clients somewhere else, expanding their life and their profitability. Board correspondent Steve Stovall reports. Getting a company's message out and onto television could soon get much easier and cheaper. What new? Marley roofing felt, 38 kilo roll. The vehicle recycled TV two. commercials. Great okay. set. The idea has been launched in London by John and Sophie Martian. Their company, TV Link, finds clients outside of Britain, sizes up their requirements, then matches them up with an existing commercial for a fee. This commercial was originally done for a British hardware company. Sapili Benia, fourteen ninety nine B and Q. TV Link, acting as intermediary, then sold the ad to a Swedish company wanting to advertise its electric toothbrushes.